Good morning. How's everybody doing? Get my computer, see if it recognizes my face. All right, we're good. We're good. All right, so we have some uh, setup we're doing right now because we couldn't have it up here during wor worship, obviously. Don't want uh, Steph or anybody to trip over a table. That would be bad. So um, a few months ago, I started uh, a series called Unlikely. I um, started talking about that idea of something and us as people being unlikely. The first part of the series was an unlikely person, right? And we said that while we may count ourselves out being used by God for a lot of different reasons, that may seem valid to us. God uses unlikely people throughout the entire Bible. And even though we may relate to those people, we may relate that, hey, well, I'm unlikely because of X, Y, or Z. God used the same type of people in the Bible constantly. And it wasn't, the deciding factor for that was not that they were amazingly talented or that they were great leaders, but that they were available. They were available to be used by God. They said, probably not me, right? But your will be done. We also said that each of us is God's workmanship, and we're all created to do good things. God inspired, God ordained things. We're all supposed to do these things. We all have, were created for them. We even use the word masterpiece, and maybe some of us don't like that word masterpiece too much because we look at ourselves, we think, not me, right? I look in the mirror every day, I'm like, whoa, you laughed way too hard. Whether you're comfortable with the word masterpiece or not, what it really means is that God sees you as someone who, who can do amazing things and amazing potential to do those things. God sees you as somebody that is very much likely. You're someone who can be used by God in your day-to-day -day lives. And the bottom line last uh, few times, a few months ago, right, was this, is that God is not attracted to your abilities and God is not distracted by your inabilities. So today I'm going to show you a picture of a painting that most of you probably have seen before, okay, or studied in, in school or heard about it or are familiar with it. If not, just act like you are, okay? Do, do one of these. <laughs> if you're doing that, I know you're lying. Um, <laughs> all right, so before we get to the painting, that this isn't art class, this is church, and you're thinking, what are you doing, Joe? That's okay. Uh, just stick with me. Don't start Facebooking, scrolling. If you're doing this, I know you're not taking notes because the thumb's just going like that. But stick with me. All right, so let's throw the painting up on the screen. Let me get out of the way. So this is uh, Water Lilies by Claude Monet. This is one of his paintings, one of his more, more famous ones, right? Anybody heard of Monet? Anybody? A few? <laughs> yeah, somebody's pretending I heard that. <laughs> Nicely done. So uh, this is from a group of paintings, actually, called Water Lilies. Uh, what we're looking at, essentially, is just a pond with uh, some vegetation, some plant life on it, and some shrubbery, if you will, around it. Uh, <laughs> nothing really all that special about it, right? It's, it's a pond. Nothing that magnificent or glorious about it. But Monet saw, when he saw this pond, was something incredible. He didn't just see a pond. He saw a masterpiece. He saw potential. He saw the light reflecting off the water. He saw... Uh, the surface of the water, the texture of the water lilies. He saw all of these things and was like, wow. He saw the depth of the scenery around him. But us, right, we see something that's just kind of typical. We just see some, some water lilies, right? If you're walking in a park and you walk through this, around this pond area, you're probably not really going to stop and look at it and think much of it. You're just going to kind of enjoy your walk, right? Think about whatever you're thinking about, talk, whatever you're talking about. You're just going to kind of pass on by. But Monet saw something beautiful. In fact, the painting that I'm showing you is a one painting of a series of about 250 paintings of the same pond. <laughs> by the way, the same pond. Same plants. But Monet was cap capable of capturing it in different ways every time, right? Different times of day, different lighting, different colors, right? So... Even though it was the same pond, he saw it in 250 plus different ways, and he painted it 250 plus different ways. He used his creativity, color, texture. He took a scene that you and I would think, meh, and made it a masterpiece. He saw the beauty in it. 
And then what he did is, is which much more challenging, I think, is he took what he saw, the beauty, and then he translated it to a painting, right? That's, we could see it, right? A lot of us could see it, but could, could many of us do that? Not likely. But here's the thing. Monet's masterpiece isn't a masterpiece because of the pond, because of the location of the pond, right? It's not this famous pond that everybody knew about at the time that wanted to go see and visit because it was this great thing. Nobody knew about the pond. Nobody really cared about the pond. Matter of fact, other artists painted the same pond. A lot of other artists painted the same pond. Has anybody ever heard of those paintings? Nope. Pretty forgettable at best. But Monet saw something extraordinary, right? And extraordinary simply means beyond ordinary. And he took it to the next level and he put it on a canvas. It was his perspective and that point of view, this insight, right, that allowed Monet to create something beautiful. He saw the extra, and if I had to guess, I bet that Monet probably didn't ever look at that pond the same way. And I'm sure that maybe when you see the next pond that you walk through, you can be like, oh, you probably won't look at it the same way either. If there's a temptation that a lot of us might fall into, it's that we see life and the circumstances of our lives and the everyday, the normal, like most people see, saw that pond full of water lilies. We don't see the beauty. We don't see the, the masterpiece. We don't see the potential even. What's the big deal? There just doesn't seem to be anything extraordinary about the lives that we're leading, right? At home, at work, in the car, anywhere else for that matter. I'm just going through life, doing our thing. It's boring. For some of us, because our lives are boring, our circumstances seem less than ideal with little redeeming value. So I'm going to do something here with my, my uh, canvas. Um, for those of you that don't know, I am not Monet, but I'm going to draw for you, okay? Here, here's, here's the rules. There's no rules. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to draw what you, what you tell me. So the question I'm going to ask you is, what are some ordinary places that are a part of your lives, okay? So I'm going to draw them, but like I said, I'm not Monet. I'm going to start, okay? So for me, the military is an ordinary part of my life, right? I've been doing it for a very long time, been involved with it for a very long time, so I'm going to draw something for that, and uh, hopefully you know what it is. Give me one second. What is it? What is it? Somebody say sock? What kind of, that's, Eng that's England. <laughs> that is a boot. Okay, so now, now it's your turn. All right, so I want you to uh, shout out some things that are part of your ordinary, your day-to-day your -day lives, and I'm going to draw them, okay? So like I said, bear with me. I'm going to do a few of them, okay? I don't know why it says books and not library on it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, wow. All right, now that we've completely derailed, let's keep going. This is fun. The gym, okay. Gym. That is basically a spitting image of Felix. Like, I, I feel like you could probably lift more weight than that. You, you should probably try lifting more than that, but whatever. All right, let's keep going. Let's give me another one.
All right, that, that, that one's good. You guys, you know that one's good. All right, what else? What else we got? Rain. Is that, that works for rain. All right. Any more else? Anything else? Children. So many stick figures. So that one's got cool hair. All right, so what else? What else is a normal, normal everyday part of your lives? Walking the dog near the river. You're trying to get a Monet. Walking the dog, whatever. That one's good too. I'm getting good at this. What else? What? Anybody else? Anybody else? Church, thank, thank God. No, there's a cross on it. That's a church. No, it doesn't, it doesn't look like a library because it doesn't say books. All right. Good fun. Good fun. Thank you, Phil, for putting that together for me uh, very last minute. And uh, you're welcome for my drawings. <laughs> right, yeah. I'll auction this at the end of the... All right, so mo for, for most of us, right, uh, this pretty much sums up our lives, right? Pretty, pretty ordinary, normal things, right? Go shopping, which is the worst thing on the planet to do, right? Grocery shopping, not fun. You know, work, I see just normally life. We're walking, we got children, we got the library, books. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say the library was boring. I said, darn it. But it's nothing dramatic, nothing really all that special, right? It's just our, our normal everyday lives that everybody's talking about. Like, like don't, don't get me wrong, life can be cool at some times, right? We all go on vacations every now and then, or we go to, on day trips or go to the beach, and that's, like, exciting and fun. But for the most part, it's like that, right? It's, it's pretty typical stuff. Maybe you're looking at what we have on the board, and you're wondering, how could God show up in a lot of these places? Hopefully he's showing up at church. How could God show up in a car on the way to work? How could God show up at work? How could God show up when I'm at the library reading a book? How could God show up at the gym? How could God show up at the grocery store on a walk with my dog? How can God show up in any of those places? There's just the normal stuff, right? There's nothing spectacular there. So a few months ago, I spent some time talking about God, how God takes us ordinary, unlikely people and makes a masterpiece out of us, each one of us. He takes us, even when we appear ordinary and average, and makes us a workmanship. He makes us his workmanship, specifically. But maybe you're sitting here today believing that God, maybe, maybe he did make a masterpiece out of you. But what about my circumstance? What about X? What about this? What about that? What about the life that we're living day in and day out when we wake up, go to work, Come home, uh, make dinner, right? Go to the grocery store, get the kids ready for bed, brush our teeth, right? Go to bed, like watch Netflix, whatever it is our name, like how is, it, how is God showing up in this ordinary situation? How does your life become something extraordinary 
through all that ordinary. Because we're busy. We'll have a lot to do. Maybe you're thinking, okay, I get that I'm not ordinary, but my life sure looks like it based on what we just talked about. I live and breathe in ordinary places. Look at what life happens, right, on the board, what we talked about. It's not exactly a grand stage. It's not. It's not something that people are going to talk about on the news, right? If that's what you're thinking, I would agree that at first glance, at first glance, things look ordinary. But do you think that it's possible that there's potential there? I want you to ask yourself that. Is there a possibility that there's potential in those ordinary places? Is it possible that when we see a simple pond covered with water, lilies, and vegetation, that there's something beautiful, something big and extraordinary to be uncovered, just like Monet did when he made that painting? So if we can start living like that, if we can start thinking that there is that potential, that something extraordinary is going to happen, not only possible, but probable, it could literally change everything. It could change the trajectory of your lives. So the thing is, there, there, there aren't a lot of people who realize the potential in the situation or circumstances when they're in it, right? We just see what we're in right now, and it's either good, bad, or ugly. But we're not looking outside of that. We're not looking at this good, bad, or ugly and saying it's extraordinary. We're just getting through it a lot of the time. Most people look at where they are and wonder, how could anything significant happen here? Some of us may even look at other people and say, how could anything significant happen there? Right? I didn't point at Phil. <laughs> we look at, uh, at where other people come from even, and we say, no, 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 no. Nothing good comes from insert location here, right? How could something extraordinary come from that person, that home, or that neighborhood? But we're not the only ones that ask those questions. People ask the same exact thing about Jesus. He was getting ready to gear up for his public ministry, and people were asking the same questions about him. You would think that it, in the history of ever, if there's one time that people would not miss that, it'd be when Jesus was gearing up for his ministry. But they did. They missed it. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but Jesus has always kind of had a thing for the unlikely. Just think back to his humble beginnings. Here, here, here's Jesus, right? Son of God, the image of the invisible God, about to take on flesh and bone, about to step down from heaven and walk in the midst of his creation. Think about the weight of that. Think about your entry if that was going to be you. I'm, if it was me, I feel like I probably wouldn't pick a barn in a trough. I'm not saying that there'd be like smoke machines and lights, but there would be smoke machines and lights. Because I'm fabulous. <laughs> but not Jesus. He went for the ordinary. He went for the barn and the trough. He, he chose a teenage girl to be his mom. He chose a simple carpenter to be his dad. Animals things that don't smell good on the ground. That's where it all began. Not exactly extraordinary. Not what most people would think the savior of the world is going to come from. But that's Jesus' story. Extremely humble beginnings. Jesus grows up in a little town called Nazareth, and that's in Israel. So scholars say that Nazareth isn't, was never even mentioned in any kind of ancient like, scholarly sources until like 300 A.D., and the reason for that is because it was so insignificant. Like, meh, we don't need to worry about that little guy. Uh, uh, scholars also uh, allege that there was probably about a population of about 480 in Nazareth when Jesus was born. So not exactly a thriving metropolis, right? Very small town. Anybody from a small town? Anybody from four, a small town of 480 or less? I got one. That's a small town. So in case you're not putting all the pieces together, Jesus had what you might call an ordinary beginning. Typical childhood, typical parents, right? 
living in that small town. You can imagine how some people reacted when they heard that Jesus, a man from Nazareth, shows up and starts performing miracles, claiming to be the Messiah. Not just the Messiah, but the Messiah that the prophets wrote about, right? The, the, the person that they've been waiting thousands of years for. So both the Gospels, Mark and John, they record a skeptical response. So listen to what John says when word started getting out about Jesus. So let's look at uh, John 1, verse 45, really quick. So Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So check this next verse out, verse 46. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Right? Nathaniel's got some attitude. He's got problems. But let's, let's, let's back up. Nathaniel gets a bad rap. If somebody came up to you and said, we found him. Jesus is here. Would you be like, yeah, right. Would you be like, sweet, let's go. You got to ask yourself that because let's be real. I, I might be a little skeptical if I'm honest with you. Like, mm, are you sure? So the scripture doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it seems to imply that Nazareth didn't have a whole lot going for it. But that's where Jesus is from. That's where he spent his childhood, his teenage years, where he learned from his father about becoming a carpenter. That's where he was raised. While it may not seem significant, I think we can, we can uh, learn from this because if we're honest, we've asked the same kinds of questions. Is anything extraordinary going to happen here? Wherever you may be, here, there, or anywhere else. Can anything good come from being a mechanic? Can anything good come from accounting? The answer is no. Just kidding if you're an accountant. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a joke. Can anything good come from Thetford? Thetford's a smallish town on the grand scale of things. It is. It's a small town on the grand scale. Is anything great, extraordinary going to come out of Thetford? Could it? Can anything good come from Tesco's? I love Tesco's. Everything good comes from Tesco's. <laughs> Wish we had Tesco's in America. I'm going to have to open one. If we do, we don't have one in Idaho, so they're probably. So it's the question that we ask ourselves, whether consciously or subconsciously, when we take a look at our everyday lives, this is what we say. This is the most unlikely place for God to show up. Can anything good come from where I am? So there were, in Jesus' time, there were many people just like Nathaniel who didn't have a lot of confidence in Jesus because they didn't have a lot of confidence in Nazareth. They're like, ah, I don't know about that. Some people knew Jesus' family and wondered how this kid down the street could be so important and so influential. How could he be the Messiah they had waited thousands of years for? But here's what the doubters and scoffers and the skeptics soon learned. They learned that God was doing something. He was making something happen. And he was doing it in spite of where Jesus had come from and in spite of what others, check that, in spite of what others thought about him. Unsuspecting town of Nazareth, Jesus is growing and becoming exactly who he needed to be before starting his ministry. That place was chosen. So here's the good news, and I would say the vital news for us. Where we come from, the ordinariness, so to speak, of our daily lives, what makes up day in and day out lives for us, does not determine, right, does not determine whether or not God can do something extraordinary in our lives. I'm from Nampa, Idaho. Can anything extraordinary come from there? Yes. Yes, it can. I'm from Thetford. Can anything extraordinary come from there? Yes, it can. Like that Monet painting where we see an ordinary pond and some plants, Monet saw the raw material for something extraordinary, for a masterpiece. Jesus certainly didn't come from any place that we would suspect a savior of the world to come from. Would anybody expect Jesus to come from a small town that nobody knows, nobody cares about? The savior of the world? It was there that God transformed the idea of ordinary and did something extraordinary, showing us and the world that he's bigger than any idea we may already have or any limitation that we might create. 
Now, here's the hard part with that. He's bigger than any idea and, and bigger than any limitation that we put in place. Whether we really believe this or not determines how we will respond to some of the biggest opportunities of our lives. We can see significant things happen in, through, and around us, but we have to believe it first. The truth is there are some of you sitting here who wish that your circumstances were, in fact, ordinary. Maybe the word is normal. You'd give anything for boring. There's some of you who see these, your circumstances and your place in life, and you would give anything to go to have that boring time. Not because there's, you don't have a lack of excitement, but because there's hurts or there's pains that you come from. You wonder if anything good can come from your home because your marriage is a wreck and you hardly know how to communicate with your spouse without it ending up in some kind of an argument. Can anything good come from that? You wonder if anything good can come from your job. Sure, it helps you pay your bills, your insurance, pays for gas. Not much gas because it's expensive now. But is there something more to that, to your job, to where you're at, where you work? Does God have... Uh, you at work for another reason, maybe. Can anything good come from that? Maybe you're new to church. You haven't exactly grown up accustomed to the traditions or the, the Bible or how God works or how to live like Jesus, and maybe you think, does that count me out? I, I, haven't, I didn't grow up in church. I, don't, I, can't, I can't do this whole Christianity thing. I can't be a leader of any kind. You got to count me out because I'm just too new. You wonder if anything good can come from the pain you've experienced. It isn't so much that things are typical or boring, but it's more that things are painful and broken. Wherever you are, maybe you're wondering, is it possible for anything good to come from where I am? Is it possible for anything to good to come from where I've been? You see, we keep looking back at that, and we hold on to it. We have this chain wrapped around our hand, and Jesus broke that chain, but we still, we're still holding. He broke the shackle, but we didn't let go yet. We're still looking back. Can anything good come from where I've been? I used to ask myself these questions all the time because I didn't grow up in church. I come from a fairly wild childhood um, that was not always good, a lot of bad stuff that happened. And I would argue and wrestle with God. After I got called to ministry, I, I, got, I would argue and wrestle with him. I would tell other pastors I think we have this wrong. I'm doing it. I'm not doing well. I'm not enough to be called to ministry because of my past. Here I am hanging onto the chain that Jesus broke. You may be unlikely like me, but God is ready to use your life. The answer to all those questions is yes, it's possible because God makes it possible. There's nothing that you can do to make it possible, but God can. Even though everything about our circumstances just, it might scream ordinary. Guess what? God can do that. God can work through that. Maybe we think that our lives are beyond repair. I've been too bad. I've done too much crap. God can work there. He uses those things that appear beyond repair for something far more important far more beautiful than we could have ever done on our own. He will use those things. He's not bound by our expectations. He's not bound by our circumstances. He's not bound by our past. All these things are a chance for Jesus to surprise us, to show up and do something that none of us saw coming. Jesus' entire life was in one way or another him talking about expectations and flipping them on their head. He took the rules and the laws and he flipped them on their head. He took expectations and circumstances and flipped them on their head. It started with his birth in a barn and it ended with his death on a cross. No one expected the Messiah to meet his end with a Roman form of torture. Do you think anybody that saw Jesus coming was thinking he's going to die on a cross when this is over? 
It was an unlikely ending. No one expected Jesus to be bloodied. Nobody expected Jesus to be beaten. It was an unlikely outcome. No one saw a cross as a place for God to show up and do the extraordinary. Nobody. It was an unlikely place. In our minds, it doesn't make any sense. It certainly didn't to the, the, the disciples at the time either. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to God because it was his plan. God's perspective and God's plan go far beyond what we have in mind and what we have planned today, what they had planned then. So that's why God took that unlikely place, the cross, and he declared, he declared that it wasn't the end after all. The world thought it was crazy, but God didn't. So let's look in 1 Corinthians. Paul talks about the difference between the way the world thinks and the way that God works. It says this, It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. In other words, appearances can be deceiving. What may seem unlikely and improbable to us may be just the right kind of place for God to do some work. What seems unlikely to us is ripe, ready for God to harvest. We need to get rid of our preconceived notions and open our minds to what that, that God just might have a better plan for our circumstances. God just might have a better idea than us. God just might not have a limitation that we put in place. You have a broken marriage? God can work there. You had a traumatic experience, maybe as a child. God can work there. You didn't grow up in church. God can work there. Don't discount yourself because your family is dysfunctional. Don't discount yourself because of your past. Don't discount yourself because of what you limit yourself with. God works differently than the world does. We have to remember that. We don't do things the way God does. We don't see things the way God does. God looks at your circumstances and sees something that he can work in the midst of. No matter what that circumstance is, you may, in a, you may be in a good spot right now. You may be in a great spot right now. God's going to work in the midst of that if you let him. You may be in the darkest depths of your life that you've ever been. God's going to work there too if you let him. Sometimes the most unlikely places can be something more. I'll give you an example. I was a youth minister for four years when I was living in Idaho. Um, it was a mobile church, much like this one, when we got here in 2017. So set up and tear down every week. And I had been working with youth for a while. And uh, I had been thinking, okay, I need to take some classes to help me with this. I need to take some classes to get me in a better spot to help other people out. To help these, these youth grow in their faith and disciple them better. And I'd been thinking about it for quite a while, probably about a year at that point. And th this day after church, I was helping some people move a piano. And I verbalized it for the first time. I said, we were having talk about some, something else. And I asked, I said, I said, what do you guys think about me taking some classes to help me with, my, help me with ministry? And they, we talked through it. And, but that was the first time I kind of felt good about it. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this thing. That was the first time I verbalized it. Later that day, we were in the mall. Uh, my job was to distract my brother-in-law, Clark, while his mother got the, the uh, employees to load a bed. She was going to surprise him with this bed that he wanted, right? He was, I think he was in middle school. And he wanted this loft bed with a desk underneath. He'd been wanting it for a long time. So his mom was like, I'm going to get it for him, but I need you to distract him. So I'm taking him through the mall. We go to the pretzel place because pretzels are awesome. Everybody loves pretzels. If you're, I feel like it's a, you have to go to the pretzel place in the mall and you go there, at least in America. Uh, because if you don't go to the pretzel place, it's weird. Like you don't, you don't have anything to walk around and eat. Um, <laughs> So we get through the line really quickly, and I'm like, oh, what do we do now? So we're walking around, and I, I'm waiting for a text saying, okay, we got it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So I'm, I see this store. I was like, hey, this new Christian store in the mall. 
hey, let's go in there and check it out real quick. So Clark and I walk in. We're looking around. There's a young lady standing behind there, this, like, U-shaped uh, register stand area, and there's a guy behind her. He's leaning on the counter, and he's reading his Bible. So we walk in. We're kind of looking at stuff, and he looks up, looks at me, and says something in Spanish. And I looked kind of quizzically at the woman, and she looked back at him and looked at me and said, are you the one that's been thinking about going to a Christian college? And I went, whoa. Uh, I was like, yes. And yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> see? Uh, and it, it floored me, and I was very caught off guard. I wasn't expecting that at all. I'm in the mall getting a pretzel and distracting my brother, deceiving my brother-in-law, really. And God shows up. So this man, through the translator, is telling me about my life. And then he says, you're going to have a ministry, and it's going to be grand. It's going to be big. And I said, oh. I'm, I'm nodding, listening, floored. So I, I, Clark and I, we walk out, and Clark's walking next to me, and I whisper, did that really just happen? And he goes, yeah. And then we walk like zombies through the mall, like, Whoa. okay. So that, a few weeks go by, and here I am, uh, Wondering, like having all these questions, right? Like, first of all, who was that guy? I think that's a fair question. Um, what's my ministry going to be? When is my ministry going to start? What is, what's going to happen with that? What does it look like? Right? So I'm, I'm tormenting myself for a couple weeks, asking me myself, and I'm like, what are you doing? Just go ask the guy. He just, he just gave you this prophetic word. Go ask him. Duh. So I drive to the mall. I'm, I'm walking through the corridor there, and I get to the store, and as God is my witness, the chains are down, the lights are off, the store is vacant, and they have packed up and moved on. I'm like, ah. Oh. He has a sense of humor. The point here is that with a past like mine, I was and am today an unlikely candidate and that day I received a word from God in an unlikely place. Ordinary mall doing ordinary things when God did the extraordinary. And he confirmed my call into ministry. It may be that the circumstances we're in, however challenging, trying, and difficult, maybe that it's just what, uh, something that God has to do in order to us, for us to take place for what God has in mind for us. The cross may have seemed like an unlikely place, unlikely place for Jesus, and it seemed like an unli unlikely place for the story to end. But what God did was show the world that the cross was not the end. But it was necessary. It had to be a part in Jesus' story in order for the story to go where God had in mind. Like Paul said, to the world, Christ crucified seems like foolishness, but to us, Christ crucified is necessary in order to get to Christ resurrected in order to get to Christ as victorious over death, in order to get to Christ as Lord, in order to get to Christ as Savior, it had to go to the cross. So what are the unlikely places in your life? What makes you say nothing good can come out of that? Family, neighbors, workplace, grocery store. The bottom line for us, the thing that we need to, to know as we leave this week is this. God uses unlikely people in unlikely places to do something extraordinary. We see things differently than God does. In fact, where we see a lost cause and a desperate situation, God sees something different. God sees the necessary step in the process to get you to where he's taking you. So don't count yourself out. He's molding you, shaping you into the kind of disciple that he wants you to be. And, and I want you to understand and focus on that word want. He wants you to be there. He doesn't need you to be there. He wants you to be there. We may be unlikely candidates in unlikely places. But how you see yourself does not mean that that, that is how God sees you. God sees potential where you don't and where maybe the world doesn't. I want you to be encouraged with that. God doesn't see the ordinary. He sees the extraordinary when he sees you. Remind yourself of that this week. Jesus works through the unlikeliest places and circumstances. And guess what? It's, it's part of his story. 
And because it's part of his story, it's a part of your story. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for...